Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. I'm Mary Lou. And in studio with us we have Gemma. And Gemma, if somebody needed to contact us, what would they need to do? You would need to call for the math homework help call in Bakersfield, 636-4357. Everywhere else, 1-866-636-6284. Email dothemath at current.org. We're online at dothemath.net uh, and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. So that's the most difficult thing you're going to have to do all hour. Okay. Amazing, isn't it? You just got through it all. So where do you go to school and what grade are you in? Uh, I go to school at Thorner uh, Elementary and I'm in fifth grade. You're in fifth grade. And how is fifth grade going? Pretty good. You like it? What's... What is special about fifth grade? Like, why do you like it so much? Uh, I got a really, really nice teacher. Well, that makes things a lot better right there, right? And Thorner, so that's a magnet school, correct? Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means? Well, I do after-school programs. And what kind of after-school programs are you involved in? Uh, I do musical. Okay. And have you done musicals for a long time, or is this something brand new for you? Uh, this is the first musical I've been in. And how do you like it so far? I really like it. You really like it. So you like doing musicals. So do you think this is something you may aspire, like look forward to do as you get older, like in junior high and high school and beyond that? Yes. All right, good. So what is the most difficult thing about being in a musical with the after school program? Mm, I think the most challenging thing is probably for stage fright. Stage fright, all right. But you've been getting over that, yeah. right? And you're doing some right now, right? You're on live TV, right? So you, this is helping you get over your stage fright, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, good. And what kinds of things have you been doing in math right now in fifth grade? We have been doing a lot of order of operations and patterns. And do you like order of operations? Yes. Briefly, can you kind of tell me what that means? Like, what are some of the steps and how do you do that? So there's parentheses, there's exponents, there's multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. Good, and that's the way a lot of kids remember order of operations. And did you know that there is something, not new, but a different way of thinking about it? Mm -hmm. So parentheses, a lot of kids think, all right, well, there's parentheses, I need to deal with that first. But have you ever seen brackets where there are straight lines like that? Mm -hmm. So that's grouping. So what they're doing is grouping. So instead of saying parentheses all the time, there are some math people, they go, we would rather you say grouping now because there's different ways to group things. And you know how addition and subtraction are opposite each other, correct? And multiply and divide are opposite each other. And you know exponents, but does exponent have an opposite like the other ones do? That's a tough one, isn't it? Those are radicals. All right, so you're finding square roots and things like that. So that's the opposite of exponents. So if you think of parentheses, exponents, instead of just parentheses, they want you to think about grouping. So any grouping symbol would be the same as parentheses. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And exponents still is there, but instead of leaving exponents all by itself, 
it would be exponents and radicals, because you need the opposite to go with it, just like multiply and divide, add and subtract. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And hopefully you'll do a little more with that this year, and as you progress through the grades, you'll see this a little bit more often. Sound good? Yes. All right, so that's your order of operations. And what else were you working on, you said? Patterns. Patterns. Do you know how long you're going to be doing patterns in math? Uh -uh. You're no, in fifth I grade? Don't. Yes. You're going to go to high school, I take it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to be doing this at least seven more years. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe that? You're going no. to be doing patterns for seven more years. And guess how long you're going to be doing patterns after that? All my life. There you go. You're <laughs> growing wiser yeah. by the moment as you're in here. You will be doing patterns your entire life. So we'll be doing some of those patterns with you from your homework page in a little bit. You'll be ready for that? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Well, before we get to all of that, let's first take a look at today's Math in the News. <laughs> Today's math in the news came from the Wall Street Journal, and have you ever seen an article this long? No. That's long. Well, it's kind of thin, so it's not really that long. It doesn't look so long. All right. So anyway, they're calling about the power, the title of it is The Power and Poetry of Random Digits. So this guy discovered a book called A Million Random Digits with 100,000 Normal Deviants. Okay, so quite a title to a book. Most people would probably see that and go, nice, thank you, goodbye. It's pages upon pages of random digits, all right? But sequences and patterns, right, what you're working on in fifth grade. Sequences of such randomly generated numbers are useful for many purposes, such as what statistici statisticians called unbiased sampling. So sampling, have you ever heard of sampling? Or can you think of something that might, where you might use sampling? <laughs> yes. Okay. What can you think of? Songs. Sampling songs. Songs. Okay. So that's an example, right, of sampling, right? So if somebody said, uh, what is your favorite song? And what is your favorite song, right? And what do you do with your after school thing with songs? I sing them. You sing them, right? And do you get to sing what you want or part of what you need to do? Part of what I need to do. Okay, and what they did is they took samples of songs, and these are because the, you can't sing all the songs in there, can you? Right, so you take samples of songs and you use those, okay? So they're sampling also in mathematics. To estimate average properties of a big data set, you sample a small subset. This is legitimate provided that you choose to sample without any bias. Have you heard of that word before, bias? Nope. We'll get to that in a little bit. So a table of random numbers can help you do that without bias. So they call it ginormous data sets and intense computer games. Random numbers are more valuable than ever. So the computer needs random numbers. The usual method is to generate them on the fly. It starts with a big seed number and then does two things over and over. It puts the big numbers through a fixed series of mathematical operations that scramble it kind of like a deck of cards. Have you ever seen a deck of cards and you just shuffle them <laughs> and they're randomly mixed up? Yeah. That's what the computer is doing with all of these numbers, okay? It's just taking a seed and just randomly shuffling them and coming up with all of these random digits, all right? Then they take the outcomes of that and just do it again and then do it again and do it again and do it again. So we're gonna get into this a little bit. So here I have a table of random numbers. So all of these numbers that are up here, all right, you can take a look at it. If you can see it on that screen or if it's easier on that screen, take a look at it. Okay. So the first one is 36518. Then would you like to go across or would you like to go down? Mm, let's go down. Let's go down. All right, so we have 36518, 46132, 31841. Do you see any sort of a pattern or does it just seem like random numbers? It seems like random numbers. Which is exactly why it's a table of random numbers. It just seems like red. There's nothing that you can look at and go, oh yeah, I see the pattern quickly there, all right? So this book was just filled with pages of random numbers, all right? So that's the first thing relating to the article. So they talked about bias, all right? You want an unbiased sample. That's a sample that is selected so it's representative of the entire population. Okay, 
a biased sample, a sample drawn in a way that one or more parts are favored over others. Okay? So if I said something like this, I said I want all of the fifth grade students in this room, like pretend it's your classroom, right? And I said, how many of you guys like chocolate ice cream? And how many kids are in your class? Mm, about 30. About 30. So let's, let's just make it 30. Mary Lou raised her hand. She likes chocolate ice cream. Do you like chocolate ice cream? Yes. Yeah, I do too. So it, it, let's just use us, right? If all three of us like chocolate ice cream, and I said every single person, right? I say most people that do the math like chocolate ice cream. Would that be true? Mm, yes. Have I taken a sample of all of the people at Do The Math. Mm -hmm. I only took it for the three of us, right? So I'm only taking the people that are on air that day. Oh. I'm not representing all of the people that work at Do The Math. So that's biased, okay? Now, if, if we went to different people, right? So if I, we say John, right? We go, John, do you like chocolate ice cream? And he says, nope, he says nay. Right? Now we're spreading it out, right? So we're becoming more unbiased. Does that make sense? And we ask the kids in the back that are doing the audio and the controlling, and we ask Brian and Kiki and Aaron and Willie and all the other people out there, right? Then we're getting a more representative sample. So that's the difference between biased and unbiased, right? If you're biased, you're omitting a group. Just us, we're the only ones that count and we represent everybody. That's biased. If we take one person from a group, let's say there's three groups, and we take one person from every group, that's a better representation now, don't you think? Because every group is being represented now. Yes. Okay. So let's take a look at a problem quickly. So, if you were taking a survey of the different colors of leaves seen in September, which of the following would be unbiased? So, I'm giving you the answers here also, right? So if we take 100 leaves from the ground, that's biased because all of the colors of leaves, one color might fall first, right? They might go, oh, all the red falls first. So we wouldn't be able to see the other colors, right? B, 100 leaves on tree branches. Well, the same color of leaves will come off the tree, so it's still biased. If we have 50 leaves on the ground and 50 leaves on the tree, then we have a mix of leaves on the ground and on the tree. And the bottom one is specific only to oak trees and oak leaves. So that's biased. We're not taking all the trees into account. And this reminds me of when we did the olives. Oh, uh, and when we College. And we picked the olives off randomly off different trees so they can you know, test with the colors and they were using an unbiased Good. sampling. Good, so perfect example right there that they're using yeah. at Bakersfield College with the olives that you guys were able to go up and check out. So a perfect example of using it real yeah. life and applying it to a course. So that is today's Math in the News. So I just figured uh, random digits and things like that, that struck me as a uh, funny little title right there, right? Who's gonna read a book of numbers, right? And just see what all that is. But random numbers are very important. So. Are you ready to get to work? Yes. All right. Get over to the board, young lady. Let's take a look at your first problem. So it says use the patterns to answer the question. So pattern A. So I'm going to have you draw. You want me to draw this or would you like to write this? Yeah. Okay. I will go ahead and write it. Let's see. All right. So we've got a little table up there. All right. So we have pattern A. All right. So we've got pattern A goes 9, 12, 15, 18, 21. Below that, pattern B. Okay. And that goes 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. And it says the patterns above are synchronized. If the number in pattern A is 99, what will be the number in pattern B? All right, Gemma. Let's think through this, okay? You can go ahead and grab a pen. So we need to find the pattern that's happening between A and B, correct? 
So what are you noticing about what's happening with those numbers between A and B? I noticed that they all have the same numbers except six. Okay. Um, oh, I see. Okay, yes. So what else are you noticing? Let's start with the, the nine and the six. What else are you noticing about that? Do you know, think about difference? What's the difference between meaning nine and six? Three. Okay, uh, why don't you write a three underneath it for me, okay? So let's continue on. What do you notice about the 12 and the nine? Uh, they are different by three. Okay, let's write that. What about the 15 and the 12? Uh, both different by three again. Okay. okay. So what is your prediction here moving forward? What are you predicting? What's going to be, what's happening? Do you see a pattern occurring? Mm -hmm. What's the pattern? Uh, for number, I mean for B, it's just adding by three. Oh, it's adding by three. Can you write that down for me? Okay, so you're adding three. So are you saying A plus three equals B, or are you saying B plus three equals A? B plus three equals A. Okay, so let's write a B in front of that plus sign for me. So we know that whatever the number for B is, we're going to add three to it and put equals A. So no matter, so you've established the pattern, right? So no matter what A is, or no matter what B is, we can find the other, correct? So do we know what A is? What number do 99. we have? 99. So underneath the A, let's write 99. And then let's bring down our equal sign. And let's bring down our pattern of plus 3. So do you think you can find out what this number B would be? Yes. How? How can you find that out? I think that I would add 3 plus 99. 3 plus 99? Okay, do that. What is 3 plus 99? So think about this again. Oh, Nine wait. plus one is, change that to a zero Sorry. for me. Oh, that's okay. Just change that to a zero. You could, yeah, use that. There you go. So let's change that to a zero. So Gemma, let's, this is 102, correct? Oh. Bring that one down for me. That's 102. Do we want, is B larger than A? Do we want, if this is 102, do we want it larger or do we want this smaller? Do we want B smaller or larger than A? Um, Let's see. Which is larger, 21 or 18? A. Okay, so A needs to be larger. So instead of adding 3 to 99, what should we be doing? Subtracting. Subtract, okay. Let's subtract. Let's go 99 minus 3. What is that? 97. Go one more down. Oh, sorry, 96. There you go. Okay, so cross the 102 out and let's put 96. So now let's double check. You know your pattern is plus 3, right? Mm -hmm. So let's write 96 here. And let's add 3, put plus 3. Does that equal 99? Yes, it does. It does. So again, by finding patterns, by looking at it and decoding it, we could solve anything, right? If we know what the pattern is. And Mike was talking about how you're going to continue with patterns on and on and on, because that's what math is about. Math is about finding that pattern. And once you find a pattern, we can always find the missing number. Very good. Good job. Nicely done. So we will have some more pattern work for you to do, but you've done some great work so far today, Gemma. For your efforts, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at the Broken Yield Cafe, so congratulations on that. As a reminder, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon. The phone numbers are at the bottom of your screen periodically throughout the program. We'll be back with more right after this.
Did you know that sea turtles have been living on planet Earth since the time of the dinosaurs? Around 110 million years. There are seven different species of sea turtles, six of which, green, hawksbill, Kemp's Ridley, leatherback, loggerhead, and the olive Ridley can be found throughout the ocean in both warm and cool waters. The seventh species, the flatback, lives only in Australia. What's amazing about sea turtles is that after years traveling the open ocean, they return to the nesting grounds where they were born to lay their eggs. In their voyage from nesting to feeding grounds, some species will travel more than 1,000 miles. But life is filled with danger for a sea turtle, especially the hatchlings. On the beach, birds, crabs, raccoons, even foxes will eat hatchlings. And if hatchlings make it to the ocean, they are still tasty snacks for seabirds and fish. However, the greatest threats to sea turtles aren't from natural predators, they are from humans. Accidental catch in commercial fisheries or entanglement in marine debris are serious threats to sea turtles, as well as destruction of beach habitat, harvesting or poaching for meat and eggs, and even boat strikes. But people aren't just sitting by. Nations are working together to protect and conserve sea turtles. In 1981, an international agreement made it illegal to trade all seven species of sea turtles and their eggs, shells, or meat internationally. Governments are figuring out ways to reduce bycatch, such as requiring new designs of fishing gear and changes to fishing practices to make them less likely to capture turtles. And marine protected areas are being established in important sea turtle habitats. Conservation organizations are working with local communities to help change fishing practices, as well as transition incomes away from turtle harvesting and toward turtle tourism. Other local efforts include working to reduce sources of marine debris, monitoring sea turtle nests to protect them from poaching, and passing laws that prevent irresponsible development on known nesting beaches. A healthy ocean depends on sea turtles and sea turtles need our help. Did you know that North Atlantic right whales don't have teeth? They are baleen whales, which means they have comb-like plates in their mouths that filter food from the water. Their foods of choice are zooplankton, called copepods. They eat between two and 5,000 pounds a day to support their 55-ton weight. That's as heavy as eight elephants. The North Atlantic right whale got its name from whalers. Because these whales travel slowly and spend a lot of time at the surface, they were easy targets. For whalers, they were the right whales to hunt. Although international protections banning whaling went into effect in 1935, North Atlantic right whales are still one of the most endangered species in the world. With fewer than 500 left, they are now the right whales to save. But the major threats to this species are still from humans, including vessel collisions and entanglement in fishing gear. In fact, scientists examining scars on whale skin estimate that 82% of North Atlantic right whales have been entangled at least once. But steps continue to be taken to help protect this species. NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service has established speed restrictions for vessels during migration season. And thanks to the collaboration with the shipping industry, international shipping lanes have been adjusted as well. A whale alert app is available to those in the Northeast Atlantic that warns ship captains when right whales are detected nearby. And it is a federal crime to approach a right whale within 500 yards without a special permit. That means we must stay a distance of five football fields away from right whales. With careful conservation and recovery work, the population of this species can hopefully continue to rebound. A healthy ocean depends on North Atlantic right whales, and endangered whales need our help. Once again, we certainly do appreciate these videos that we are receiving about the ocean. Everything about the ocean is simply fascinating. It is amazing. Just awesome. I mean, it, inspiring. I mean, it is just amazing to learn so many things about the ocean yeah. that we are this year with these videos. 
We are celebrating our 20th season on Do the Math this year. So that's a pretty big accomplishment. Yes, it is. And uh, I don't know, did we take a moment to talk about how you got involved with Do the Math? No. I think we did. I, I don't think we did past. this year. We have in the past, but not this year. Let's hit this uh, real quick. <laughs> so I remember Sorry, that we used to do some contests with Do the Math. Yes, and I'm and all about And we would have contests. students call in from their rooms, and this class that phoned in the most would win. We'd go out to their class, and we would award the class some prizes and talk to the teacher and stuff like that. And your students won one year. They won a couple years. Oh, a couple of years. There you go. No, no harm in throwing that out there. Uh, it's been a long time, and I've been here a long time. So I do remember that you won, and we went out to your class, and that's how we first met you. Yes. And what then drew you more to be part of the program? Well, honestly, I was a new sixth grade teacher when the show started, and I got the email about, hey, anyone interested, come on out. And I honestly thought about coming out, but I was a first-year sixth grade teacher at right. the time, and thought I don't have enough behind me to join the show. Ten years passed, and you guys, I yeah, won that contest. You guys came out, and it was just perfect fit, and it so was the time to join. So how long have you been with the program? Ten years. So ten years. So you've been yes. with us half our life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to be here another ten years. Yes. There you go. That's what we want to hear. You've been here for ten. You're going to stay here for yes. ten more. And you are now a part of the Kern County Superintendent of Schools office. Yes, I am. So what is your role with that office? Oh, so much fun. It's an amazing team. Um, what we do, what my part is, is actually I am going out to school districts throughout Kern County, meeting with leadership, meeting with teachers, um, getting into the classroom, doing supports wherever needed, whatever supports teachers need with mathematics, that's our role there. It might be with modeling some kind of strategy or just doing an observation and helping teachers meet goals with mathematics. Um, just debriefing, talking math, spreading the love of math all over Kern County. And I'm just having a fantastic time. And our team is amazing. And it's growing. It is growing. Right. So, and, and the reason is because of the number of schools and school districts in this county. Yeah. Because this county is the size of a state. Yes. And you do need a lot of support to go out and help and, all of the schools. Yes, and we are the lead for California. Our team is the lead for California. So there you go. Very proud. And you're of part it. of Do the Math. And so that means Do the math. math is part of the lead for all of California. Yes. yes. And <laughs> California leads, others follow. Yes, absolutely. All right. We know you're a great ambassador for Do the Math. Speaking of our 20th season, also we have another partner that has been with us for many, many years, and that is Science for Kern. And I'll tell you, we love Science for Kern and all the challenges that come along with it. Michelle is with us today. Michelle, how are you this afternoon? I am terrific, Mike. Thanks for having me in again today. Nice to see you. And uh, you've got a fifth grader with you, Gemma. She attends Thorner Magnet School. So she's got a little bit of expertise in the uh, theatrics. And uh, she's working on patterns. And what will you be working with today? Today, Gemma and I are going to be doing a, uh, a science activity involving force and uh, simple machines. Are you ready to get started, Gemma? Yes. So at your house, do you have any wind-up toys? No. Okay, so do you know what a wind-up toy is? Yes, I do. Okay, so we have today um, a couple of, we actually have three, uh, wind-up robot toys um, that we're going to be uh, working with in a couple of minutes. But I also want to point out that um, when we're finished today, and for uh, all students um, that uh, enjoy science, um, there are always books out there to support your science learning. And today, um, I have brought along with me a couple of books, one called Clink, which is a, a fiction story about a little robot, very similar to um, our robots today, our little wind-up toys. And the, crazy uh, shenanigans that this robot gets into. And then if you want to learn more about how wind-up toys work and um, things like that, uh, we have a nonfiction book too that you can go to to learn more. And books like this about all sorts of science topics can be found in your school library. So I just want to point out that I have those here today. So do you, have you thought about how a wind-up toy works? Yes, I have. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, 
I think that wind-up toys are made up of a lot of bolts, screws, and wires. Okay, so if we, so for instance, right now I have three wind-up robot toys sitting on the table. If I was, um, for instance, wanting to make one of those move, what would I have to do? Wind it up. Okay, wind it up. Excellent, that's why we call it a wind-up toy, right? So this wind-up toy, it has the little winder there. And so what I want you to predict first is this. We're going to have like a little uh, tester race here with our wind-up toys. So if, if I do not touch the wind-up knob, how far will my wind-up toy go? It will not go it anywhere. It will not go. Perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to know. So if I have zero winds, I'm going to go zero centimeters. Okay, we're going to measure in centimeters because that scientists use uh, metric measurements. So if we wind it once, how far do you think it's going to go? Mm, I will predict five centimeters. Okay, five centimeters, so about to there, okay? So we'll, to keep some consistency going, let's, um, I want you, I'm going to hold the button here, I'm going to hold a little winder, and I want you to turn the robot and so that its head is up on top again. So just grab its little feet and kick it around. Give it a twist. Okay, ready? Ooh, all the way around. Now you ready? Let's put it down on your mark. Get set. Go. Uh, so how far did it go? Three centimeters. All right. So one turn was three centimeters. Excellent. All right. So let's move this one out of the way and go to a fresh for a fresh wine. Let's go two wines this time, so we need to flip it twice. Let me get my big hand out of the way. One, two, hold on to it tight, ready? Let's put it down again. How far do you think it's gonna go this time? Mm, about to here. All right, let's see. Oh no, it's gonna go crooked. Oh, let's give it a little turn there, see how far it goes. Oh man, how far did that one go? Uh, four centimeters. Okay, so two wines, got four centimeters. All right, so let's move this one out of the way and let's get a, well, it still wants to go on its own. It wasn't for done walking. Are you ready? Okay, so how many times are we gonna wind this time? Three. Okay, go. Two. And three. Got it, got it, got it. Oh, let's hold it tight. Ready? We got it. Ready? Here it goes. Oh, come on, buddy. Finish your wind. Oh, so how far did that one go? That one seems to might be a defective robot. Three, Three wines, centimeters. Three centimeters. All right. So, before we go on to our next part, um, let's think about, so the, <laughs> if our, well, we had a little uh, lapse in our data, and if we were to keep going, let's say we did four wines, what would you expect to have our robot do? Uh, go a longer way. Go further, right? So we're anticipating then that probably the more winds, the more twists of the knob that we do, the further that the robot will go. Now, you know what I've done? Because I've had some questions myself. I always, I'm always, I'm a scientist, right? So I'm always curious about the world around me. And I always want to know how does stuff work? And I've always been fascinated with wind-up toys. And so I was curious. I was wondering what is inside there. So you know what I did? Hmm. I took one of those robots apart. Do you ever take things apart at your house? Yes. <laughs> it's cool, right? Especially if you can figure out how to put it back together. And so what I want you to notice is my robot friend here. And um, I actually, for the most part, just took out the screws and I took it apart, and look at this. Check out what's inside there. So what are these? The legs. Got some legs, what would this be? The top, top half. And got body and head, right? What's that? His armor. Yeah, it's like his little backpack armor thing. And then we've got these two pieces, those are? Arms. Got some little armies there, got his little arms, screws that kept it together. Now, check this out. You see this part here? What was this? The wind-up part. 
Yeah, this is the wind-up part, right? And so check this out. I don't know if we can get that on camera, but can you see that little dark part in there? <laughs> see that little dark circle? So check this out. I want you to watch. So if we turn, turn a little knob, and now watch that little dark spot. Oop, come on, let's go. Can you see it moving around inside there? Mm -hmm. All right, and so see these little gears here on either side? What would have been attached to those? I think the legs. All right, it's the little legs, right? So you can picture it inside, inside our little robot there. Mm -hmm. For Show the camera there for people at home. All right, so if you, <laughs> now he wants to go. Um, I was curious, right? I still, I still can't see. I'm still like, whoa, what is going on? What's making that guy go? So you know what I did? I took a hammer to this thing. And look what I found inside. Check that out. That was inside of here. So check it out. Let me put that on my hand there so we can get a good shot of it. Check that out. So I want to hear from you. What, what is going on? How, how is this making that move? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. What do you think? Go ahead. When you twist the wind up, it winds up and it makes the legs move because you winded it up. Okay, so uh, tell me more about winding it up. What do you think happens when I wind it up? I think when you wind it up, the uh, wire here gets tight and then it uh, starts to like unwind a little bit so that the, the robot can move. Okay, so something inside here you're saying then? This is then, so do you think, I mean, and look how big it is right now. So what must happen to this when it's inside of here? It gets all tight and wind it up. Okay. So it, yeah, obviously, <laughs> the way it looks right now is not what it looks like. It, obviously, when I hit the hammer on it, it went poof, it exploded, right, and it got nice and big. So yeah, you got some really good thinking going on, Gemma, on there with um, our wind-up toy. So yeah, you know, uh, when you're curious about how stuff works, you know, why not take it apart and see what's going on inside to uh, satisfy that curiosity. So I want to do one more thing with you because we can make our own wind-up toys, okay? And so I've got here um, a couple of uh, different versions of the same wind-up toy that you can make at home. And I've got a wooden spool um, with a hole in the middle. And I took a rubber band. I've got some rubber bands through the middle there that I, I ran through. And you can see where I took um, half of, I took a piece of toothpick and I broke it off so that it was the same size taped it on there, I've got it through the, uh, through, the, um, through the rubber band there, and then I've got it hooked on the other side through a washer with just another toothpick. Now check this out, there's you know, all kinds of, because we want to make stuff, do, do fun science at home with the, with the things that we have. So you can see there that one, I've got the same um, toothpick, but if you don't have toothpicks at home, you can even use small um, paper clips on your um, wind-up toy. And here, I thought, well, I wonder what would happen if I, instead of, a, um, instead of a toothpick, what if I used a pencil, right? So if I want to make this thing go, like a wind-up toy, I've got it all set up now. I've got my um, rubber band that went through the center. I've got my washer there to make sure that it'll actually spin. You know, when I was playing around with this, I was doing it without the washer. What do you think happens if you don't put the washer on it? I think it messes up. <laughs> it won't go. I, was a, I learned that lesson the hard way. Science is all about trial and error. So how do you think, based on what we did with the, um, with the robots, with the wind-up robots, how do you think I can make this thing go? I think maybe rolling up the pencil and winding it up. and then Ooh, What word did you just use? Winding it up. Oh, like a wind-up toy, right? All right, so if I hold, I'm going to hold that there. Do you want to... You do the honors. You, you, you wind it up. 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 There you go. Keep going. Keep going. Keep winding it up. All right. You ready? So now when I put it down, what do you think is going to happen? 
I think it's going to roll. It's going to go? Which direction do you think it's going to go? Mm, forward. You think it's going to go away from us, forward? Is that what you mean by forward? Yeah. All right, are you ready? Ready for, ready for me to let it go? Yes. Well, look at that. So, how far did it go? 51, 2, 3, 4, 50, 55, 55, 56-ish. Do you think, let's do it one more time before we have to end our segment today. Do you think that we can make it go further? How? What do you think we should do? Wind it up more. Okay, well, let's do it. Wind away. Oh gosh, I almost dropped it. It's all right. All right, you stop winding when you're ready. And I think that is more than last time. Okay, help me put it down. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> Way to go, Gemma. Prediction correct. Give me a fist bump. That was awesome. You are an amazing young scientist, Gemma. Thank you. It was so fun doing science with you today. Thanks for that, Michelle. And if somebody wanted to find out more about Science for Kern, where would they need to go? Uh, they will go to our website, scienceforkern.org. All right, thank you very much for that. And thank you to Science for Kern for being part of Do the Math for so many years as we celebrate our 20th year. We also have another partner that has been part of Do the Math for many years, and that is the staff and students at ROC and CTEC. And today we're going to be taking a look at their produced video on business, banking, and finance. So I did graduate from college, graduated from Cal State Bakersfield. Um, I worked in the banking industry for 14 years, and then I went to human resources for two years, and then this is my sixth year of teaching. Um, we do a lot. We learn about the economy. Um, we learn about the details of how an, an economy can fail or be successful. We do a lot of personal finance, business finance, uh, situations where if you were a bank teller working at a bank, things you would do, a lot of uh, economics, we study both micro and macro economics. You know, Federal Reserves, um, banks, we learn about um, businesses, what goes on behind the scenes of a business and just the economy overall. We focus a lot on communication skills. Um, a lot of this is for customer service and being able to communicate with your customer. Um, just the willingness to try. Uh, get out of your comfort zone and being um, available to kind of explore different options. Um, most of the way math is used in this class is not necessarily solving the smaller equations, but more of the, the bigger problems and the bigger uh, equations in life. For example, um, monetary policy, fiscal policy, uh, economic decisions made by both the government and you as a citizen. Um, and more, I would say, not necessarily like general math, but economic math. Okay, uh, so when students are counting money um, and doing transactions for customers, they have to be able to use a calculator or do some math skills on the computer. Um, and then when we get to finances, they have to be able to figure out uh, different financial plans and break even analysis. So some basic math and basic algebra. I absolutely would, yeah. I think it's very beneficial and you can learn a lot that will help you in your future. Um, I would. I think it's essential in life. Um, it, it'll definitely prepare you for a lot of future references, um, especially when it comes to managing money and just in general, I think it is essential. My students go out to internship second semester. Uh, they go to banks, credit unions, and investment firms. Um, so practice the skills that they used in class. Um, it's a great opportunity for them to see what the financial career is like and if they want to explore it in the future.
And once again, a big thanks to all the staff and students at ROC and CTEC. They produced those videos 100% on site with the students doing all of the work right there. In the past, we've shown videos from ROC and CTEC and we've helped produce those. We produce those and shown you what they do with those programs. This year, they are 100% producing those videos and we certainly do appreciate all of the work that they're putting into it this year. And they keep getting better and better and better as the year goes on. All of them have simply been fantastic during our 20th season of Do the Math. Right now we have a bit of a problem that we're going to do that uh, John wanted to see. How are we going to do this problem? Because it's one that we've all heard of before, those of us that have been, uh, let's say, around mathematics for a while. Okay. So here we'll uh, take a look at the camera. This is one penny. All right. So Gemma, I've got a question for you. Suppose you're going to work for me and I want you to work for one month, every day for one month. Would you rather get one million dollars right now, at the end of the 30 days, you're going to get a million dollars, or would you rather take the one cent and then double your money every day for 30 days? Which one do you think you would rather have? Would you rather start with one cent and double it every day for 30 days? Or would you rather just have a million dollars at the end of the 30 days? Mm, I think I would take the penny. You would take the penny? Why? Uh, I think that it would be a big number at the end of the 30 days if I doubled the penny. So you think it's going to be a big number at the end of 30 days. Mm -hmm. But it's only a penny. I know. <laughs> so let's take a look, all right? Just swing around. We're going to have Mary Lou start writing some stuff up on the board, all right? So you've got a penny, all right? And you've worked for a day. So after a day, if it doubles, how much money will you have? Two cents. Two cents. So we're going to put 0 0.02 up there. It's because okay. we're going to write money. So we're going to do that in that order. Okay. So Gemma, you've got two cents. Now, the next day, how much money will you get? Four cents. All right, so put it up there, four cents. Now you've worked three days. What's the next amount going to be? Uh, six cents. Six cents. Well, you're going to double it. Oh. Remember, we're doubling the day before. All right, we're not going to add it. We're going to double it. Eight cents. Eight cents. Now you've worked hard for three days, and you've got eight cents on that day. You sure you want to stick with this? Let's see how far it goes. Let's see how far it goes. <laughs> well, you want to go all the way? or would you get it? Let's do it again. All right, so on day four, what are you going to get? 16 cents. 16 cents. So we're going to kind of speed this up a little bit, all right? So on day 15, you're going to have $327 and 68 cents. Now take a look at this, Gemma. You've worked half the month, and you've got three hundred dollars basically. Are you sure you still want to do this? Mm, I'm thinking the million dollars might be better now. You're thinking the million dollars <laughs> would be better now. Why? What's making you think that? Because for a couple of days you were going to go with this doubling thing. So I've already worked half the month, and I only got three, $327.68. But that's not really half of a million dollars, so I'm going to take the million dollars. OK. So right now we've got half the month, and you got $300, right? So you're thinking it's nowhere near half a million dollars and I'd rather take the million dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to day 26. After 26 days, you're going to have $671,088. So $671,088. Okay, $600. So six seven one. Six oh seven one. Yep. Zero eight eight, and 64 cents. So now, after 26 days, we have $671,000. And we've almost worked the whole month. Do you still want to go with the million dollars, or do you want to go back to doubling it now? I still want to go with the million dollars. You still want to go with the million dollars. 
You're sure? Yes. You're a little young for this, but it was like, let's make a deal with Money Hall, <laughs> all right? So you've got this, you see what's in front of you, and you see what you could possibly have. Now, at the beginning, you said, let's double it. And for a couple of days, you said that, until we got halfway through, and then you're like, well, let's see how far it goes. And you're like, take the million dollars. Right, now we're at day 26, you have $671,000. That's pretty close to a million, isn't it? But we're almost out of the month. So, on day 30, all right, if we keep doubling it, you're going to have ten million seven hundred thirty-seven thousand seven hundred thirty-seven thousand four hundred eighteen dollars and twenty-four cents. So, Gemma, after thirty days of working, would you rather have doubled that penny or taken the million dollars? Double that penny. Double the penny, right? <laughs> So therefore, you get $10 million. Now, there's some people go, well, well, listen, you're starting with two cents on the first day after that. Let's start with one cent. Mm -hmm. So Mary Lou, just on the outside of the amount, okay. we're going to write these down. Let's go one cent for the first day. OK, so we're starting with one cent. Gemma, what's going to happen on the second day? You get two cents. Two cents. Then what? Four cents. Four cents. Then what? Eight cents. Eight cents. OK, now we're going to jump all the way down to day 30. Okay, so let's say we do this, because you can see we're halfway with each of these numbers, isn't it? So day four is 16 or 8 cents, right? So the other, if we're starting, like some people go, no, it's one cent on day one, right? Instead of the two after the that's first day. That's what I thought. <laughs> and that's fine, yep. right? So if we're taking half of everything, we're going to take half of what day 30 is. Does that make sense? So far we're taking half, right? Two cents went to one, four cents went to two, eight cents went to four, 16 went to eight. We're taking half. So on day 30, it's gonna be $5,368,709.12. So even if we did that, would you still like to take the penny a day and double it or the million dollars? Penny a day. Penny a day, right? So there's two different ways to do that. We'll take a look at the formula in a little bit, but I think right now we've got a uh, phone caller on the line. So, Brianna, how are you this afternoon? I'm good. Good. Well, you know what? We're going to get a new page up there, and as soon as you're ready with that problem, let's hear what it is. Okay. It is... Find the simple interest earned to the nearest cent, and my numbers are five hundred and eighty dollars, two percent, two percent, six months. Yep. So five hundred eighty dollars at two percent for six months, and you want simple interest. Right. All right, Mary Lou's okay. going to help you out. Okay, it's Brianna, correct? Right. Okay, Brianna. When we're doing simple interest, there's three things we know. What are the three things that we need to know? The amount, the amount, percent, and the amount, Ex and the time. Exactly. So the five hundred eighty is our amount, right? It's called the prince. Right. Is that called the principal? Yeah. Okay, that's our principal, correct? The two percent is our what? Our uh, interest rate. Exactly. It's our rate. And then the six months is our word. Time. Time. Exactly. So we, we actually call it PRT, which is our principal, our rate, and our time. We know that. What do we need to do to those three things in order to figure out the simple interest? Mm, multiply them? Exactly. We need to multiply all three of those. But to do that, we need to adjust some things. First off, the 580 is spot on. We don't need to adjust that. However, mm -hmm. This is a big mistake that a lot of people make, that 2% is a percent, it's not a decimal. So Brianna, how do I change 2% to a decimal? You move the percent sign over 2, so it becomes 0 0.02. Okay, and I'm going to use our parentheses to show multiplication. And then <laughs> 6 months, when we're doing time, we're actually multiplying by years. This is not by years, this is by months. So now we need to adjust and we need to think. Six months, what would that be in years? How could I 
think about this. If I'm thinking about this in years, how much of a year does that represent? Half of a year. Exactly. So we're actually not multiplying it by one, we're going to be actually multiplying it by one half. And if you want to do just decimals, again, we can multiply it by 0.5, right? Instead right. of one half. So let's multiply our 580 times 0.02. Are you allowed to use calculators on this? Yeah. Okay, do you have a calculator with you? Um, oh. I've got yeah. one. Okay. It's 11.6. Thank you. So 580 times 0 0.02 is 11 and 6 tenths. And now we need to multiply that by 1 half. So we're going to multiply that by 1 half. And remember, Rihanna, whenever we're multiplying anything by a half, we're just really dividing it by 2, right? So, Mike, what's a half of 11.6? 5.8. 5.8. So now, there you go. There is our worst simple interest, which is $5, let me write this correctly, $5.80. Because remember, we're talking money. If you just write 5.8, that's not correct because we need to put it into the form of currency. And in the form of currency, again, we're always rounding it to the nearest cent, and the cent is our hundredths place value. So again, with simple interest, always remember, you're taking your principal, you're multiplying it by your rate, and then you multiply it by your time, your time in years, your rate in a, per, in a decimal. And there you go, it's $5.80. Nicely done, Brianna, for your effort today. You've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at the Broken Yield Cafe. Congratulations on that. In studio, Gemma, come on over, Mary Lou. Okay. You and Gemma are gonna work on this problem together, all right? So John's gonna kinda peek okay. over your shoulder. And you're going to talk about a set, and I'm going to give you one minute. Okay. So to see if you can find a set. The rule of this game is to find a set, and the set meaning they all have to be the same, or they all have to be different. So which would you like to find out of all nine of these? What is different? Which three things are different on here? This one, this one, and that one. <gasps> this one, this one, and... Well, these both have kind of that shade, right? What about this, uh, this one, because it's clear? Two, because it's shaded? And three, because it's solid. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So can you find something similar now? What's the same? Mm. Remember, it could be all the same shade or all the same numbers? This one, that one, and that one. <gasps> Why are those three the same? They all have the same shade. They're there absolutely. You go. Great, so you were able to find some sets really quickly yes. right there. And this is a game where, it's not a game, but an activity to look at patterns also. Yeah. So Gemma, did you learn a little something today? Mm -hmm. Good, did you have fun on the show today? Yes. That's exactly <laughs> what we wanted to hear right there. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30, and until we meet again, Continue to do the math. Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.